Jim Herr didn't know how to put together a good show. I'm John Rutland with a retro review of WCW Halloween Havoc 1990, aka Messy Finishes the Musical. This was not a very good show, which is weird because a couple of the matches actually were pretty good, but every single one just had a dodgy finish, and I don't understand why they thought it was a good idea. I think Ole Anderson was also booking at the time, so that might explain it. He didn't give a shit at this point. I mean, why should he? He had so much goddamn money from all the time that he wrestled and booked and owned part of a territory. Why the fuck would he care? And also, Jim Hurd was a fucking idiot. Also, this was a uh, this was edited because there were four matches that were taken off of the original broadcast. It's like WWE got the uh, VHS edition and we're like, yeah, we'll just put those six matches on the network and just cut the rest of the stuff off. Probably a good idea. By the way, this is at the UIC Pavilion in Chicago. Here are the dark matches. Tim Horner beat Barry Horowitz in about eight and a half minutes. Rip Rogers, goddamn idiot, beat Reno Riggins in about four minutes. Not on the network. Terry Taylor beat Bill Irwin in about 12 minutes. Who wanted to pay to see Terry Taylor versus Bill Irwin for that long? Terry Taylor, good worker, could not overcome the Red Rooster gimmick, and Bill Irwin was also there. And it was Brad Armstrong uh, defeating J.W. Storm in about five minutes, and then Master Blasters, Nash and whoever the fuck the other one was, versus the Southern Boys, and they beat them in about seven and a half minutes. JYD defeated Moondog Rex in about three, three minutes, 20 seconds. That, that, that's the stuff they cut off. Probably a good idea. So, JR dressed as a detective of some sorts. Pauly Dangerously, a.k.a. Paul Heyman, just gonna call him Heyman, dressed as a vampire. Couldn't talk with his fake teeth in. This is also when he had a hairstyle, and he was gonna change it, but he had to mull it over first. And then Shivani's dressed as Phantom of the Opera, uh, talking to Tommy Rich and Ricky Morton. Uh, Robert Gibson was injured at this time, so they decided to just do a knockoff Rock and Roll Express and... Boy, you want to do a knockoff, Tommy Rich in 1990 is a good person to put in a knockoff team. They took on the Midnight Express with Jim Cornette and the last pay-per-view appearance of the Midnight Express in the full-time run, at least. Now, Cornette's talked about this on his podcast and actually told some pretty good stories. I want to get right out of the way. Yes, some of the takes he has on modern wrestling ain't exactly the best. Sometimes I think he goes way, way too far and is way too set in his ways, but I like the historical side of Jim Cornette. Hence why I have the t-shirt back here that has the Cornette face on it, because it is a pretty good reaction for some things, especially even back then. Um, good stuff, actually. This was, I don't know why the ring mat was red. I really don't understand that. Not like it was soaked in blood. It was just very, very strange. There was, this is also when they were doing the ramp to the ring, and it was just very, very odd. However, the match was pretty damn good. Um, nice teamwork by both, especially for Rich and Morton, considering that Morton was the one having to do most of the work, because Rich wasn't very good. Rocket launcher on the ramp, that looked like it goddamn hurt. Uh, lots of racket usage, because Cornette was just going to do, you know, he was going to do what the fuck ever he could to get his team to win. Uh, yeah, Tommy just was kind of just there as a sack of shit, honestly. I mean, I know it sounds mean, but that's just why he was there. The Southern Boys show up dressed as Cornette to distract him, complete with tennis rackets and big suits and stuff like that. And the racket gets to, uh, racket gets used, and then Rich gets uh, the pin, one, two, three. So that's pretty much it right there. The Midnight Express gets screwed over with the racket. They were just going to, you know, they were just basically getting jobbed out at this point. Jim Hurd hated the Midnight Express for whatever reason. So... We didn't get Sting with a promo about the Black Scorpion, Sid Vicious, and then suddenly the Black Scorpion shows up, kidnaps a fan, and does a magic trick, where they're on this part of the stage, they do the explosive, explosives and stuff like that, no, no, they're gone, and then suddenly there's these fireworks, and then they mistime the cue, and the Black Scorpion and the fan are right there on the stage, like about five to ten seconds later than they should have been. And then Sting rescues a fan. And who the fuck paid for the Black Scorpion, uh, to see the Black Scorpion on pay-per-view? Honestly, who the fuck paid to watch that? It was a terrible angle. It did nothing for Sting. It was a bad idea because originally it was going to be Al Perez, a.k.a. Discount Seth Rollins, with all the charisma taken out. And then it was just a bunch of other people playing him. And then eventually it was Ric Flair competing against Sting at Starrcade 1990. God damn it, I have to review that. Fucking hell. Okay, this was not very good, though. The... Black Scorpion stuff was really shit. So, then we get Garvin and Hayes, the Freebirds, with uh, Rocky King in their corner, versus the Renegade Warriors, uh, Chris and Mark Youngblood. I mean, the gimmick wasn't all that good, the Renegade Warriors stuff. Also, this match got 15 minutes. Why? Why did it get 15 minutes? It shouldn't have even gone past 9. It's not that these two teams couldn't work. 
They just couldn't work past a certain point, and there were so many rest holds, my god, all the fucking rest holds in the goddamn world. And Randy Horton, in 2004 to 2006, takes his hat off to you guys. So, uh, the distraction led to a DDT, and the Freebirds, in quotation marks, got the pin. This was a match that should have been at least a third less than what it was. So then we get the Horsemen, well, Flair, Arn, and Sid Vicious talking about their respective title matches. Sid yelling a lot. Sid did all the yelling in his goddamn promos. And then we get the Nasty Boys versus the Steiner Brothers U.S. Tag Title Match. Pretty good stuff. Instant brawl. Shocking, because the Nasty Boys were never known as being great in the ring. But somebody did point out, and I don't, I don't remember who, forgive me. I, I do remember your comment, I just don't remember the name. But somebody pointed out that this match is actually pretty good. And I do agree. I do agree with them. I actually totally forgot about this match for what it was. Because the Nasty Boys were never technicians, but they focused on Scott's back. They worked on it for a while. The Steiners were great because whether you wanted to go up for suplexes or not, they were going to fucking throw you. They were going to throw you no matter what. And they were strong enough to do it. Eventually, uh, Sags was bleeding at one point pretty goddamn bad because they had to kind of cut to a bit of a wide shot. Rick gets in. Finally, we get the Frankensteiner. Pins knobs, one, two, three. And then Nasty Boys attack afterwards. And then shortly after, or sometime after, and I think they cut a match at this point, so this is supposed to be a little bit later. But for the broadcast, it was very strange. Scott's being interviewed by Shivani, and then suddenly a concession worker attacks him. It's uh, Sags, Jerry Sags of the Nasty Boys, attacking him. And it just hit him in the head with the train. It was very odd, but it's just the fact that it was edited like this. You didn't know that there were matches they edited off. You'd think, wait a second, how did this happen only like two minutes after this brawl occurred? So it's very odd they decided to put up this edited version. That being said, the match was actually pretty damn good. And then Flair and Arn versus a team of Doom, cue the Morbo voice, or Invader Zim if you really want to go with that. NWA tag title match, good stuff. Except for the finish. Finish was a little bit dodgy. I mean, I understand why they did it, but it was a little dodgy. Not the dodgiest finish. That comes up in the main event. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, <clears throat> cameraman gets knocked down at one point. Um, horseman focusing on body parts. Some good stuff. A few close near falls to the point where you thought Doom actually got them pinned. And they just decided to pull up. No, 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 he didn't do that. But they kind of, you know, maybe there was a bit of miscommunication there. And then both teams battle into the, um, you know, back entrance way uh, where, you know, they were going to use it for Sting and Sid a little bit later. And it was what it was. It got a double count out. The crowd kind of booed that, but at least Doom kept the titles. And then Luger uh, versus Stan Hansen. JR, this is going to be man on man. Whatever you're into, JR, whatever you're into. Uh, horny JR staying, staying constant even in 1990. So it was a brawl. It was better than one would expect. Lex Luger, and I'm not fond of giving credit to Lex Luger, who really is responsible, at least partially responsible, for the death of Miss Elizabeth. But during this time of 89, even 88, I'd even say 88 to 91, he was on a goddamn tear. He was doing some great shit with the U.S. title. He was in the midst of a 523-day reign. Uh, Dan Spivey does show up at one point after a rep bump, hands the bull rope to... Uh, to uh, Stan Hansen, almost forgot who the fuck I was talking about because some of these names blend together and it's weird to see Stan Hansen on WCW pay-per-view in 1990 when he was making a fortune in All Japan and actually uh, Spivey and him had teamed up in All Japan and good good God, Stan Hansen is one of the greatest American superstars ever to be in Japanese wrestling, especially for All Japan, I mean he was huge and he eventually ends up hitting a lariat on Luger and gets the pin 1-2-3 so shockingly, Stan Hansen wins the U.S. title, holds it for about just under two months, and drops it back to Luger at Starcade 1990. It was very strange because could you imagine if they had just not done this and just kept it on Luger until he lost it? He would have had it for about two years. That would have been that would have been really really that would have been very interesting. It would have been a record that never would have been broken. Not that this one got broken because he actually was honestly the greatest U.S. champion of all time. He did a lot of really good shit. And again, I'm not fond of getting, giving credit to Luger. And then we get Sid versus Sting. NWA title match. The crowd cheered both. They really loved Sting. Nobody looked like Sid. Sid was very impressive. The match was fine for what it was, but the ending killed it. They bowed in that back entrance way where the Horsemen and Doom got counted out. And then suddenly, and then, and then Arn and Flair also, you know, come out and they're like, oh, what's going on? Suddenly, Sting shows back up. It's actually Barry Windham cutting his hair to look like Sting. He picks up Sid for a slam, but gets pinned. One, two, three. And then, oh, Sid's celebrating with the title. Oh, no, he's 
He he's won. Sting's title reign is done. Balloons are falling. Pyro's going off. And then Sting shows back up. Apparently, he has string on his arm, so I guess he either decided to pull the string or somebody tied him up so the fake Sting could show up. And then he um, shows up. He gets an inside cradle on Sid. One, two, three. And wins the title. Or keeps the title. It's very, very odd. I mean, I understand they wanted to protect Sid. But it was very strange. It wasn't really all that good. And they had the pay-per-view kind of on a sour note. But let me know what you guys saw of this show in the comments. Like, share, subscribe, Twitter handle in the description. I'm John Rithlin. I'll see you soon.